OK, we're going to move on and look at audit reports now. Audit reports should be a subject that you are reasonably familiar with as the information and knowledge that you need to be happy with is all from the F8 syllabus. There is nothing new at this level. It's a bit like audit risk and audit work. There's nothing more to know. The problem is that the accounting issues and maybe the complications of the auditing issues that come up in the actual questions are likely to be harder. But the same basic knowledge and technique needs to apply. Now with audit reports, there are really two ways in which you could be asked a question. You could be given a story and asked what are the likely audit report implications. Or you could have it the other way round and be given the audit report itself and be asked, is it any good? Is it the right report? Is it clear? Etc. So what we need to do is remind ourselves of the key knowledge, which is what does an audit report look like, what goes into it, and secondly, there are six major outcomes that we need to understand. Firstly, let's have a look at the content of a standard audit report. Well, normally an audit report starts with a title. And typically it will look something like that, making clear that this is the report from auditors who are independent of the company. Also within the title will be the addressee, who is the report to, and typically, of course, that's the shareholders. It is then typical to have an introduction, a sort of terms of reference, if you like, just explaining what it is you've actually audited. The reason for that is that especially with listed companies, what the shareholders will actually receive is an annual report and financial statements, and we need to make clear that we have not audited the annual report. So it is typical to list out the actual things you have audited. So if you're in Britain, profit and loss account, balance sheet, cash flow statement, etc. And if we're doing international stream, the statement of position, the statement of comprehensive income, etc. It might also be a good point here to make clear what you have done with the non-audited stuff in the annual report. This is often referred to as other information, information which is presented with the audited accounts but itself has not been audited and as you'll know from your F8 studies with other information auditors have to read it and make sure if there are any issues in there they've been dealt with a subject that we'll look at after we've done the main bit of audit reports. Now it's important to realise at this early stage in audit reports that the audit report is going to be different depending on which country you're in. As a result, the UK audit standard is a bit more prescriptive because it has UK specific things in it than the international audit reporting standard which is trying to give a basic framework that every country can then use. 
Typically, after the introduction, we get some auditor responsibilities. In the United Kingdom, this is split up further to include a basis of opinion section. In this part of the report, we have a fairly detailed explanation of how the audit has been done. So it will say things like, um, the auditing work was done on a test basis, in other words, we didn't check every single thing, and it will have familiar words in like reasonable assurance, sufficient appropriate evidence, free from material misstatement, all the normal sort of technical terminology that you'd expect. It will also explain which auditing standards the auditor has followed. Now there is one point in this section in particular which is very important. Typically, an auditor would say that we planned and performed our audit so as to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. As we will see shortly, if you did not get sufficient appropriate evidence, at this point you will have to say so. You cannot write, we performed our audit to get sufficient appropriate evidence, if you didn't actually get it. If we haven't got sufficient appropriate evidence, that is called a limitation on the scope of the audit. And we'll look at what that means and how it affects the audit report shortly. The next major section is the opinion, but the audit responsibilities section might have something else in it, depending on which country you're in. In many countries, the auditors may wish to put a liability disclaimer to ensure that any third party reading the audit report, i.e. not the shareholders but anybody else, cannot then sue them if they rely on the audit report and lose money in some sort of transaction as a result. That extra paragraph, often referred to as the Bannerman paragraph, named after the Bannerman legal case, which we saw earlier on the course, might be in the audit report, but it only applies in certain countries, so I won't add it in here. The opinion section is probably the most important part of the report. It's the conclusion, the executive summary, if you like, that most people will go and read first. Generally speaking, there are two opinions given, but in some countries you may be required by your government to give more. Just to give you an example of that last point, in the United Kingdom, auditors always now give three opinions, at least. Because as well as saying whether the accounts are true and fair and properly prepared, UK auditors also need to comment as to whether the director's report is consistent with the financial statements. <laughs> 
So just be aware that if you're looking at a real audit report, what it actually says in the opinion does vary by country. Now, typically, that's it. All that you would then get is the name of the audit firm who've done the audit, the date that they're signing the report, uh, often the city in which their audit office is based that did the audit, and in some countries now, you don't sign the name of the firm, you actually have to put the name of the partner, the engagement partner, who is actually signing the report. But it is possible that there might be an extra section after the opinion. And this extra section, which we'll be investigating shortly, is known as an emphasis of matter. So, those are your contents for a fairly standard audit report. What we need to do now is look at six possible outcomes that you'll need to deal with in the exam, when they might occur, and what changes to the audit report when those outcomes happen. We need to be a bit careful here with our terminology. There are two words that are very easy to confuse, and they don't mean the same thing. A modification is a change from the standard audit report. So anything which is not the first one, the standard boring report, if you like, where there's nothing to say, any change to that is known as a modification. There are various types of modification some of which are called qualifications, and some of which are not called qualifications. So just bear in mind that modification and qualification are not the same thing, but that qualifications are examples of modifications. One is part of the other. So here we go. Six outcomes we need to understand. The first example is the basic unmodified report. In the United Kingdom, if you selected 100 big companies and got hold of their audit reports, virtually all of them would be that. It means that the financial statements are true and fair, have been properly prepared, and there is nothing the auditors want to say at all. This is a completely standard report. You could just print it off your computer and insert the company's name. There are five potential modifications that you need to understand. So, what are they then? Well, one of them is not a qualification, so it's unqualified, but there is an emphasis of matter, something important that the auditors want to make known to the shareholders without actually changing their audit opinion. Well, that's one of them. What about the other four? Well, There are potentially two ways in which you could disagree 
with the directors. If you disagree just with one or two things in the accounts, it would be fairly easy in your audit opinion to say, except for those things, everything else is OK. If, on the other hand, you are disagreeing with so many things in the financial statements, or maybe not that many, but they're all really, really huge, it would be very difficult to say, except for that, 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 and that, the financial statements give a true and fair view, because there's virtually nothing left to give a true and fair view on. You're disagreeing with everything. In that case, your opinion will be adverse. So, a fairly small qualification, although still material, becomes except for. Except for that, the financial statements give a true and fair view. But if you've got major disagreements with many things in the accounts, your opinion will be adverse. The other problem you can have is called a limitation on scope. Now, you're not disagreeing. You cannot disagree because you have not received sufficient appropriate evidence to be able to form an opinion. If you haven't got any evidence on one thing in the accounts, but you can check everything else is right, you would be able to give an opinion that said something like, except for any adjustments which might have been necessary to that, had we had the evidence, the financial statements show a true and fair view. And I like to call that an except for might qualification. With a disagreement, it was that is wrong, but everything else is fine. With a limitation on scope, it is that might be wrong. I can't tell. But everything else is fine. If, on the other hand, there is such a major shortage of audit evidence that you can't form an opinion on the accounts at all, that is known as a disclaimer of opinion. So there we go. We've got six possible outcomes. You've got your basic audit report, which hasn't been modified or changed at all. You've then got the emphasis of matter, where there is no problem with the opinion, but you want to say something. And then you've got two levels of disagreement and two levels of limitation on scope. You have the material level, where you'll say, except for and then say that the rest of the financial statements are OK. And then you've got the really material, often called the pervasive level, where it's so serious, you either give an adverse opinion, the accounts aren't true and fair, or a disclaimer of opinion, I can't tell. Now, what we need to do next is look at these six possibilities and understand how the five modifications would change the look of the audit report. Because if your examiner is going to give you one of these, you need to know whether things are in the right place and have been dealt with appropriately.
So, let's take a look at those five modifications and how they would change the audit report. Firstly, emphasis of matter. With this one, we get a completely standard normal audit report, but we get something extra as well. After the opinion has been given, we get an additional paragraph. In this paragraph, typically, it will make it very clear that the opinion is not qualified. And usually, this is used to highlight something in the annual report or maybe in the financial statements that the auditors are keen that the shareholders have seen. We're not saying it's wrong, we're just saying it's so important, I do hope you've seen it. So that's the change that you would get. There are two main examples of situations where an emphasis of matter is likely to appear on the exam. The most common one is where a company has going concern problems, but they have fully disclosed those in the financial statements. As such, since they've properly disclosed them, you cannot criticise the accounts because the accounts are right. But it's such an important disclosure, maybe it's a big legal case or an investigation into the company, that the auditors want to make sure that the shareholders have read it. A second example would be to do with the annual report. Let's imagine that you've read the annual report and there's something in there which just isn't correct. Or maybe it's misleading. And the problem is it suggests that there might be something wrong with the financial statements, even though you've done the audit and you know that the financial statements are right. If there's something in the annual report, which you don't audit, by the way, but it is suggesting that the financial statements that you do audit are wrong and you think they're not wrong, you could use an emphasis of matter to highlight this to the shareholders. So that 
is an emphasis of matter. Let's now consider the second type of modification, which is disagreements. As an auditor, it is possible to disagree with the numbers in the accounts, with the uh, disclosures in the accounts, lack of information. And with the disagreement, whether it is except for, or the really extreme one, the adverse opinion, the only thing affected is the opinion section. Firstly, the title of the opinion section should make clear that the opinion is qualified. Then, in the opinion itself, three things need to happen. The first thing the auditor needs to do is explain the mistake, and normally that will involve mentioning the relevant accounting standard that has been broken. The second thing to do is to explain what would happen if this mistake were put right, so the shareholders can get a feel for what the accounts should have looked like. If the disagreement is a lack of disclosure, then it's not going to affect the actual numbers. All the auditor now needs to do is put the missing information here, if the company have failed to disclose it in the accounts. And if you have a major disagreement... For example, you believe that the company is not a going concern, but they've used the going concern basis, it's probably impossible to quantify the effects on the accounts. So in a going concern situation with an adverse opinion, it may be very difficult to explain what the accounts should look like. Once you've explained the mistake the effect of correcting it, the next thing to do is either say except for or give your adverse opinion. So there we go. With a disagreement, three main things all happening in the opinion section. Explain the mistake, explain the effect of correcting it, and then give your accept for or your adverse opinion. Let's now move on and look at a limitation on scope. Just like disagreements, there are two levels of these, the except for and the disclaimer, where you don't give an opinion at all. With a limitation on scope, two parts of the audit report are going to be affected. 
Now, it depends partly which country you're in as to exactly how this is done, but the key is, wherever in the audit responsibilities or basis of opinion section, it would say, we planned and performed our audit in order to get sufficient appropriate evidence, you now need to say something else. Because you need to add, however, our evidence was limited. And then you need to explain what was missing and preferably why. So that explains the missing evidence. The other effect is the opinion section. There's no need to explain the situation anymore because you've already explained it. All you need to do in the opinion section is either say, except for any adjustments that might have been necessary, or we cannot or do not give an opinion. Now, in some countries, there might be additional reporting at this point. For example, what is a limitation on scope? It's where you haven't been presented with all the evidence. Don't forget that typically, companies are legally required to keep proper accounting records and also legally required to provide auditors with all information and explanations that they require. If the company has failed to do that, it may be that the auditors have to add additional stuff onto the end of their opinion. For example, in the United Kingdom, a limitation on scope would normally require the auditors to state after their opinion that proper accounting records might have been kept, but we can't tell because we haven't seen them all, and also to highlight that all information and explanations have not been received. So, we've looked at the six outcomes thought about when they might arise, and we've also considered how the audit report would change in those six outcomes. But bear in mind, it is possible to have multiple outcomes. In other words, in a set of company accounts, you could have disagreement with depreciation, possibly a limitation on scope over inventory stocks because you couldn't get to the year-end stock take, and you might also have an emphasis of matter because there's a major legal case going on against the company. You could get all of them. So in your mind, you must focus on what the audit report would look like. If you had a limitation of scope, in the basis of opinion, it explains the missing evidence. In the opinion, it would say, probably, except for any adjustments which might have been necessary, etc. If you have a disagreement, that's just in the opinion section. And if you have an emphasis of matter, that's the one thing that comes after the opinion. Now that we've covered all of that, we should be in a position to apply this knowledge to a question. But just before we do that, if you are given an audit report and asked to critically appraise it or discuss its suitability or something like that, what sort of things should you be on the lookout for? Number one, clarity. Does it sound clear? Would shareholders understand it? It might be that the auditors have used long technical words where maybe more normal English language words would have made more sense. 
Is it detailed enough? Is there information that you've been told in the exam question that has not been put in the audit report and yet there's no obvious reason why not? I mean, this is the one opportunity for auditors to talk to shareholders. So if you want to tell them something, why not tell them in detail? Is the report consistent? In other words, if one part of the report is suggesting a major problem with the accounts, it would be odd if the opinion then said that the accounts are true and fair. That would confuse people. So we want it to have a consistent message. Is everything in the right place? For example, if it's an emphasis of matter, it should be an extra paragraph at the end of the report. And then, of course, there's the opinion itself. Do you think it's appropriate? Or might another of the six opinions that you know about be more likely to be sensible in this situation? One final point to consider. Don't forget that in a standard set of financial statements, you have both this year's figures and also corresponding figures from last year. If there are any issues at all with last year's figures, for example, no one's audited them, they have been audited and there were mistakes, there was a qualification last year, or maybe they were unqualified last year, but this year you've discovered last year's figures were wrong. Well, if the shareholders are seeing last year's figures, any issue with them, you've got to tell them. So it's possible, for example, that you might say something like, except for the adjustments required to prior year figures, the financial statements give a true and fair view. It may be that this year's numbers are fine, it's last year's that are the problem. Now we've considered all of that, what we need to do is apply it to a question.